Good morning, everybody. I'm switching to English. Um, and uh, first, thank you very much, Douglas Kennedy, for being here. C'est bizarre parce que je parle français. <laughs> je vis à Paris depuis l'an 2000. Uh, J'ai maîtrisé la langue avec un accent que un ex petit ami uh, me dit c'est adorable, mais en fait uh, tout le monde a un accent. Um, et donc uh, je suis arrivé avec l'idée ok c'est un échange en français comme d'habitude, mais uh, ils ont insisté c'est en anglais. Désolé. Mais après, en fait, on peut parler en français. So this is how I sound as an American. So good morning. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you very much for being with us uh, uh, at the University of Bordeaux Montaigne uh, this morning. And thanks to Cécile Quintin from the Association Lettres du Monde for helping me organize this uh, lecture. It is a pleasure, even an honor, to welcome you. And I'm delighted that such a large audience has gathered this morning to give you the warm welcome you deserve. Everybody has heard about your books. However, I would like to say a couple of words about your career, if you don't mind, uh, that our students may be uh, unfamiliar with. So you were born in Manhattan in 1955, moved to Dublin in 1974 to study at Trinity College for a year, Re you returned to Dublin in 1976 and helped co-found a theatre company there. Then you joined the National Theatre of Ireland and worked as an administrator of its uh, experimental theatre, the Peacock, for five years. That was also the period when you started to write at night. Uh, in 1983, you began to freelance as a journalist writing for major Irish newspapers. You wrote several uh, travel books, including one about Egypt, uh, Beyond the Pyramids, in 1988. They were very successful. However, you continued to work as a freelance for The Times and The Independent in London. In London among Yes, in London. And I said the time moved, yeah. you moved to London. Uh, your first novel, The Dead Heart, was published in 1994. The second, the Big Picture, in 1997, was an international success story, translated into 22 languages. And The Big Picture was also filmed in France as L'homme qui voulait vivre sa vie, uh, directed by Eric Lartigo and starring Romain Duris and Catherine Deneuve. Today, you have published 26 books including A Special Relationship, 2004, and A Heart of Betrayal in 2015, uh, 16, sorry. You live both in the United States and in France, as you said a moment ago, and you speak very fluent French. Your latest book, Afraid of the Light, was published in the United States in 2021, and in this country as Les Hommes ont peur de la lumière, in the spring of this year, translated by Collet, pardon, Chloe Royer. So many thanks again for being with us today, and the floor is yours. I will be very honest about something, which is, yes, the fact that actually I just delivered my 27th book to my editor in Paris two weeks ago. And that is the scariest part of my life. I've spent about a year and a half with the book, writing it. A girlfriend read it. Um, another friend read it as I was writing it. And I rewrote it four times. We'll talk about that later. And then you have to hand it over and you wait for the verdict. It's a bit like an exam. <laughs> Same deal. Um, and it's interesting, even at this stage of my life, I'm a 67-year-old man, almost 68. Um, I'm still terrified of uh, le jugement, the judgment. Um, that never goes away. What also never goes away in writing is the fact that it's actually every morning I have to convince myself to do it. I basically, I've often said this, that doubt is part of the artist's repertoire. And 
any serious writer or composer or visual artist, my friends in all sorts of disciplines, we all talk about that. The fact that there's always this terror of, can I keep doing it? Can I not keep doing it? Everyone asks, how do you write a book? There was a very famous English novelist who lived in the Va uh, named Somerset Maugham uh, in the 1920s and 1930s. And Maugham, very, very great novelist of the time, he said, there are three basic rules for writing a novel and nobody knows what they are. <laughs> That's absolutely right. Um, a couple of years ago, I was in Rouen at, uh, to give a lecture at the Bibliothèque Nationale, and the uh, head bibliothécaire said, uh, j'ai une surprise pour vous, Monsieur Kennedy, and I was accompanied by two other bibliothécaires into this room. And in front of us, it was like almost on an altar with a shining celestial light was the first draft of Madame Bovary. And they handed me a pair of gloves, surgical gloves, you know, and I was able to touch it with the surgical gloves. And I was watching, I was looking at it, I was extremely moved because it's a novel that means an enormous amount to me. Flaubert, clearly he wrote it avec une plume. And I was watching how he was rewriting and rewriting and rewriting every phrase. Flaubert needed five years for Madame Bovary, six ans pour une, uh, une éducation sentimentale. But he was also a man who had money from his family. He had no wife. He had no children. So there was not a lot of financial pressure. He had mistresses everywhere um, and a niece who eventually ruined him. And he, he, could, eventu he could basically take his time. The other side of that coin. I don't know if you know Georges Simenon, great, great Belgian writer. Simenon wrote 300 books in his lifetime. I know his son. He lives in Lausanne. Simenon also wrote in his autobiography that he'd slept with 10,000 women as well. Uh, I think 9,800 of those women, money exchanged hands, but that's another matter. Um, but Simenon could write a novel in Kanzur, two weeks. And he was like a machine. He could write 40 pages a day, 40 pages, you know, and that's without drugs, you know, or, or something to help you kind of go, uh, get going. What's the difference? I mean, and Henri, Henri Gide said that basically Simon was one of the great francophone writers of the 20th century. So my point here is, is there a right way of writing a book? Do you do what Flaubert did, which was rewrite and rewrite a paragraph until you're happy with it? He maybe wrote three, uh, 300 scenes par jour. Um, or are you like Simenon where it just all comes out? Or something in between? I've often said to young writers starting out, there are two things that are absolutely crucial. The first is read as much as you can. As much as you can. And start to read with the idea of, start to look how the writer lays out the book, and we'll talk about that a little later, just how he, s he or she structures the novel. But the other thing is get in the habit of writing every day. I have a very simple method. I'm very prolific, not crazy prolific like Simenon. I, I wish I could write a novel in two weeks. I can't. Uh, but it takes about a year usually, but it depends. I've written a novel as short in four months, that was La Femme du Cinquième, and as long as two years, which was Cet instant là, uh, my Berlin novel. Um, the important thing is to actually work every day, and I have a very simple method, and it works. It's the same method that Hemingway used, and one of my great literary heroes, an English writer called Graham Greene, Graham Greene, who is brilliant. Um, 500 words a day. That's 1,500 scenes, à peu près. Um, the thing about that is, it's not a huge amount. And if you can, I often sometimes think, you know, writing a novel is a marathon. And if you start, and I know fr friends who have written, I mean, who have raced in marathons, and they have to train, they have to get into a rhythm for it. It's the same with writing fiction. So two pages a day, it's two pages of word, for example, that is something you can accomplish. 
And then basically, if you do that six days a week, you have 12 pages. And at the end of the year, you have about 600. But the important thing is, and this is crucial, is the discipline of doing it. And there's always going to be this voice in your head saying, I can go on my phone, you know? Some friends want to meet me in a bar. Uh, oh, there's a movie I'd like to see tonight. And it's very true. I mean, that's the other discipline is actually doing it day in, day out. And that, that's crucial to all kind of creative careers. Uh, the majority of people don't get there just by playing around. Even someone, I don't know if you've ever read Bukowski, Charles Char Bukowski, I mean, the man was a drunk, you know, smoking two packs of cigarettes a day, always with some really scuzzy woman, you know, in Los Angeles, or a few, and sitting in bars all the time. But the guy wrote every day, every day. That is the key. And also the fact that basically what you first write doesn't have to be that good, but you need to get it out. I'm, that's another thing as well. People think, you know, it has to be perfect on the first go. I'm someone, the novel I just delivered, or, or for that matter, Afraid of the Light, I wrote six drafts, six. And the book changed radically from the first until the published volume. And for me, and again, all writers are different. The first draft for me, I vomit. Blech. Everything comes out. Uh, it's too long. There's too much going on. There's too much detail. But I have the essence of the book there. And then I begin to cut and shape and change. And eventually it goes to an editor in the United Kingdom and also in France. And I hear what both of these women have to say. And then I redo it again and again. So it's... Writing is both an art, but, uh, but c'est aussi un métier, very much, and I'm conscious of that. Um, it never gets easy, um, but uh, this is what I always wanted to do with my life, and so I'm, I, I feel very fortunate that I've been able to do so. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, can we start with the, can, can we talk about your book a little, sure. okay? Uh, what about the title? Because I saw that it was an epigraph, that there's an epigraph uh, borrowed from Plato. Um, first, there's no reference, what, what book by Plato? No, there's no, 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 there's no need for a reference. Okay, and... Uh, it's, it's Plato, you don't have Okay, reference. okay, and... Uh, and uh, uh, why this uh, title and why this epigraph? Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. We only have one microphone here. Um, <coughs> titles are funny. I, uh, they come later often. Sometimes I have a title like that. Um, sometimes they come much later in, in, in the writing of the book. Um, for example, I mean, uh, La Poursuite de Bonheur, which is probably my most famous novel. I mean, that was a title that actually my English editor and I thought up after I delivered the book. Uh, she said the original title. She was a very direct woman, and she said that's a terrible title. Um, it was called Sh uh, uh, After the War, and she said that's lousy. And she said, La poursuite de Bernard, c'est dans la Constitution américaine. Here I was halfway through this novel when I just happened one day to stumble on an article which had cited this line of Plato of it, um, oui. on peut pardonner uh, un enfant uh, qui on peut, peut uh, de noir, mais la plus grande tragédie de la vie, c'est uh, des hommes qui ont peur de la lumière. And I thought, that's it. Uh, and we, we kept it in French as well, les hommes ont peur de la lumière, mais afraid of the light, immediately. I got it. And the reason being, I was writing a book very much about uh, the very strange place that America finds itself in right now. I have a, I have a theory about life, um, and if you can do this when you're older, it's smart. Everything is easier if you have a round-trip air ticket. In other words, if you're not stuck in any one place for a large amount of time. Um, I also have an Irish passport. I became Irish during my years in Dublin. So I'm European. That's good, especially now. And it was especially good during the Trump years. And 
had he been, yes, and had he been reelected, I think I might have, as we say in the States, voted with my feet and left. Um, I'm interested in also another thing that's sort of just part of what I do is I talk to everybody. And I'm interested in, in, in people, and I always am posing questions. A girlfriend said to me this once, she said, you're always asking me stuff, it's all material, isn't it? And I said, that's right, yeah, sure, that's what I do. So uh, my daughter, uh, Amelia, who's 26 and has just finished her first novel and is living in New York, but she was raised in London, she got into one of the top acting conservatories in America in Los Angeles at CalArts. So I was dropping out to Los Angeles on, you know, every two months to spend a couple of days and say hello and getting to know the city. And I started taking Ubers all the time. Why? You, it was cheaper than renting a car. You didn't have to worry about parking. I could ride in the back when you were in a bouchon. And also at night, I could drink. Um, or for that matter, since Los Angeles, like Maine, where I live, has, uh, you know, the dispenser, or you can use uh, l'herbe as well. That's completely legal now in California. So one day I'm in, a, in this Uber and I notice this driver, big guy, and he's got a tattoo of the United States Marines, which is the most fanatical part of the American armed services. I know this because my father was a Marine and he was crazy um, and very patriotic and uh, in the CIA. I mean, that's another story. But I got talking with this guy, explained that my father had survived Okinawa during the Second World War, which was la somme de, de la deuxième guerre mondiale, 200,000 dead in eight months. He was 18 years old. I don't think he ever got over it. And he said, uh, he said, wow. And I just said, why are you an Uber driver? What happened? He goes, you don't do this by choice. And he explained, he was in his 50s, he was gay, that was interesting. Lived in a caravan with his husband in the San Fernando Valley, uh, which is the suburbs. Everything in Los Angeles is a suburb. And basically, um, he had been a vendor in a company that sold cable and he was laid off. It's that usual modern thing. The small company was bought by a larger company, which was bought by a corporation, which decided to cut 1,500 people. He got eight months of salary, one year of health care, and that was it. Goodbye. 30 years of work. This is why France is a much better place on many levels when it comes to social democracy. And you know, he told me that he was r working 60 hours a week for about the equivalent of um, uh, 11, 12 euros an hour in dollars. And I turned to him and I said, listen, uh, I write books. Uh, could I interview you on the phone tomorrow? I'll buy two hours of your time, you know, and I won't pay you a 11 euros an hour. We'll make it more, okay? Um, I offered him 100 bucks. And he said, sure. And so for two hours the next day, I basically just learned everything I could about Uber and what a terrible, terrible thing it is. And how, and, I, and what I was thinking the whole time is Uber is a larger metaphor, like Amazon, a company I hate, you know, for the modern economy. In a way, we've gone back to almost a 19th century economy. And this is where you end up if you can't find work. And this was a man in his late 50s. And so that started to kind of move in my head, the idea of Uber and an Uber driver who's lost everything in America. And then at the same time, I read about an abortion doctor in Nebraska getting shot by some anti-abortion protesters, murdered. Uh, in front of his wife and two children. Um, and these were people who were saying abortion is murder. So of course, in that very American way, I'm gonna go out and shoot the doctor with a gun. And I began to sort of just put the two together in my head. And I had wanted to write something just about the craziness of modern America. I love my country and I also think it's terrible at the same time and a frightening place. Um, 
there's so much that is extraordinary about the United States, not just the sense of space, uh, the optimism. It's a very creative, dynamic country. We're very innovative. We have phenomenal culture. We have jazz. We have great cinema. Uh, we have interesting television. We have a very, very fine literature. Uh, there's so much that's going on, great rock and roll, but at the same time also it's a very ignorant country. Only 20% of Americans read books. That's it. The idea of the system of uh, salon de livre uh, that you have in France or des livres subventionnés par l'État, it doesn't exist in America. Uh, and there are two Americas now and we actually don't like each other. Uh, we don't like each other whatsoever. So that was all in my head as I started writing this book. Um, and um, frankly, also I wanted to write a novel about Los Angeles. And a Los Angeles away from Hollywood. I wrote something in one of my notebooks when I was just starting to write the book. I just said, a novel about Los Angeles without the beach. No beach, no swimming pool. Uh, yeah, a, a novel about traffic, <laughs> being stuck in traffic, being stuck on the auto route, the motorway, which is what you are, and also just about the middle class, which is what I'm from, but from back east. Okay. Oh, yes, really. Um, in an interview, you talked of a cultural war in America at the moment, mm -hmm. and even said that a civil war may well happen again. Um, can you comment? on these sure. dreary remarks. Yeah, dreary. <laughs> the novel I delivered two weeks ago is set in 2045, um, and it takes place when America has broken up in two. And there is a, the blue states, you know the system, blue states, red states, you know, blue states are liberal, progressive, Democrats, the reds are, basically Republican, redneck, frequently Christian. Although, again, in all the red states, you will find very interesting people, and actually not everyone of a right-wing bent. But my in my new book, basically, there are two countries, and there has been a kind of civil war, but uh, so sort of a, a civil war, un guerre de la secession froide. Um, and it's two very different countries both of which are totalitarian in their own way. I think, in a way, it's inevitable that things are going to come apart in America. I think what's unsettling is everywhere is the rise of the extreme right. You know, you have it here. Uh, look what happened in Italy a couple of weeks ago. Uh, look what is going on in Britain, where I lived for 23 years and was a catastrophe. When I was a young writer in London um, in the late 80s, I used to run into this clown. I used to call him, oh, it's, uh, and I, I would say this to my then wife. I said, I ran into Boris the Clown last night. And, Hello, Douglas, how are you? That was Boris Johnson. The <laughs> and I, just this kind of overweight buffoon, you know, very old, you know, public school boy. And I mean, to think that you know he was running the country for several years is terrifying. Um, the thing is, in the United States, last 10 days ago, we had an election which was not a catastrophe. <laughs> it wasn't brilliant, but we lost Congress, but we kept the Senate. And the reason why that happened is basically two groups were motivated this time, and that is your age group from 18 to, my, to 30, my son is 30, that group went out and voted, and women. Women went out big time and voted because they were furious about the end of Roe versus Wade, which was the federal law that guaranteed abortion. That was also, I was writing this before that happened, but I was very cognizant of the fact that Trump basically um, had appointed three very conservative Supreme Court justices. He had the opportunity, and suddenly the, the conservatives had a supermajority on the court, and they were going to basically rewrite the rules of American life. But there has been resistance so far. So in a way, last week there was sort of a sigh of relief, but 
the right will regroup, the Republicans will regroup. Um, I don't think this is in any way over, and I do feel the chances somewhere down the line of maybe, uh, what's interesting as well, and we've ta I, I talk with this with friends, especially friends in California, and also in New York, which is where I'm from. Um, you know, uh, according to the Senate system, every state has two senators. So in Kentucky, which is known for bourbon, which I like, and horses, which I'm not really interested in, but, uh, and, and, you know, and there's some good things in Kentucky, but uh, basically they have two senators, one of whom, Mitch McConnell, has been the sort of uh, eminence grise of the, uh, of the conservatives, a horrible guy. Um, but, you know, in California, which has the fourth biggest economy in the world, they also have two senators. They have more people in Congress than in the Senate. But there is this sort of sense that, frankly, even though the South and the Midwest have formed a bloc which has moved policy along, you know, they are not the economic strongholds. One thing to remember in life, it's very important, and I always say this. I, I talked about this the night after the Ukrainian invasion. I trained as an historian. That was what I did at university. I was going to become a universitaire, and uh, I got sidelined uh, along the way. But one thing that's very important, I always think about this, is follow the money. Suivez l'argent. Um, I mean, I said this after Ukraine. This is not just about... Putin being a madman. There's something else going on here. Uh, it's about destabilizing the European economy. It's, it's about gas, without question. It's about gas. Always follow the money. And if Putin is uh, eventually uh, decapitated, uh, defenestre, and I think that's going to happen very soon, it's also going to be the money in Russia that's going to get rid of him. All war in one way or another, is also about money. And actually, most human interaction, money is a crucial part of how it works. I mean, and money plays an important role in my novel because you have a, an Uber driver who is trying to survive uh, in a very, very expensive city on no money whatsoever, where money is everywhere around him. Um, you said that uh, in, an I in another interview that you always write in the first person and that uh, I find it puzzling. Can you clarify this choice? Or why the first person? I always write with I, je, um, why. I like having the voice in my head of the character. I've written eight books in the voice of a woman narrator. Um, I'm not a woman. I have never had sisters. I had a crazy mother who was very unhappy. So I began to sort of observe that quite early. Um, I never think as a woman or anything like that. I always think as my character. I like basically having, um, frankly, one point of view and someone thrown into the situation and how they see it. Um, it's funny, I, I wrote my first novel, The Dead Heart, uh, initially with Il, uh, ou Elle, I mean, in the third person, and I was about 40 pages into it, and my then wife read the first 40 pages and said, it's great, why isn't he telling the story? And she was right, and I went back and just changed everything to je, uh, and it worked. Um, it's, it's very different. I know people who could never write in the first person, it's, I, I write also for children. I've done three books with Johan Sva uh, and um, Les Fabuleuses Aventures d'Aurore. And Aurore is an 11-year-old girl living in Fontenay-sous-Bois, outside of Paris, um, and she's autistic, like my son. My son is autistic, but uh, quite a successful young photographer in London, and uh, complément autonome. But, and she's nonverbal, and she were, uh, writes with a tablet. Now, I'm not French. I'm not a little girl. I've never been autistic. My, and my son is very different to Aurore in his autism. But 
I always try to think my way into the head of the character and see, you know, and try to see the world with his or her eyes. The other interesting thing when I'm trying to kind of create a character is I always think about, frankly, their childhood, because childhood is crucial, what happened to you and how it affects you in adult life. I think about their pathology, because everybody has pathology. Everybody. Um, everyone has baggage. Everyone has baggage. You know, it's, uh, there's an old uh, English uh, joke, you know, at the beginning of a love affair, the road, uh, la route est complètement dégagée, the road is completely clear. Uh, you're so in love, the sex is extraordinary, you can't believe how lucky you are. And then there's a moment about a couple of months in when two lorries, deux camions, uh, arrive one morning and all the baggage falls out. And you, yes, and you start to see what happens. My daughter, who's 26, has been with a guy for three months and that just started to happen, you know. And, <laughs> and she called me up saying, you know, he's getting weird. And I went, well, there you go. I mean <laughs> and I said, you know, everyone's on their best behavior at the start, you know. And then little by little, you know, the guard comes down and you actually see what's going on, you know, and which is interesting as well. Um, or there's that other thing as well in human relationships. You see exactly what the person is and actually that this is not good, but you stay. We've all made that mistake. I certainly did. Second marriage. Um, the thing is everyone has pathology and when I'm creating a character, I'm, I'm very much cognizant of that. Um, what keeps them awake at night? What makes them nervous? What is their rapport, a rapport with money? What is their rapport with sex? How do they see themselves? And another thing that interests me in terms of just life and also individuals is basically the fact that, yeah, Cecile. Okay. Par maintenant, s'il vous plaît. Is basically the fact that, um, and I've just lost my train of thought. Um, oh, yes. I have a theory about human life, which is basically people construct their own prison, their own cul-de-sac. Um, when somebody, I, I have a plumber in Paris named Franck, and he comes in and like all plumbers set an escrow, okay? I mean, every time he comes in to do something, I'm wondering, and what will the bill be this time, you know? And I am always prepared for that, and I go, no, no, no. Should uh, accept pasta. And the other day he came in, one of my radiators wasn't working. And we were talking, and I thought to myself, <laughs> you know, I was, I made him a coffee as I always do, and he went and did his thing, and I was finishing some writing. And then I thought, here comes the conversation about his wife and what a, what a, what a, what a, what a large, terrible person she is. She's very big. Um, and I've been hearing this for 10 years how he can't stand it, it's awful, they haven't had sex in years, it's dreadful. And I said, mm, pourquoi vous restez? Oh, I couldn't leave. Um, that's interesting. Immediately, the novelist in me is thinking, okay, that's a very interesting syndrome. Why can't somebody leave a, a, a bad marriage? Why do people stay put in things and then complain about it? Why, and this is another thing, it's interesting, L'homme qui voulait vivre sa vie was a huge hit in Korea. And I've been out there twice to give talks. Um, and it sold a million copies. And what I realized, it's a novel about a, a lawyer, almost 40, in, in, in the suburbs of New York, going into work every day in the city, who wanted to be a photographer. And he followed what his father told him to do. This was what my dad kept trying to do to me. He kept saying when I was young, you'll never be able to write, you know, be a lawyer, be a businessman, you can write at night. And I said, you know, lawyers work 60 hour weeks. They just kill themselves with work because they have to try to make partner and get a permanent job and earn a lot. And basically, had I followed my father's advice, I'd probably be an alcoholic today. Uh, Fundamentally, 
people do this all the time. They often will listen to exactly what their parents want them to become rather than what they, they should become. Don't do that. Just don't do that. Avoid that completely. Um, I said this once to my daughter. You know, I said, the way you will rebel against me is by marrying an accountant. <laughs> so, I mean, but again, why do people trap themselves into lives they don't want? That's one of my big themes. And it's also just a, a very interesting fact of life. Um, I think the most important thing about writing is observing tout uh, temps regarding how people are, how they dress. Clothes are an interesting language. You learn a lot about how someone sees themselves, how they want to present themselves to the world. Um, what are the things that are m making them anxious? Everyone is neurotic. Everyone is neurotic to a certain degree. What are their neuroses? These are all in my head as I am writing a book. Okay, I have, I still have plenty of questions, but I think that have talked, have said enough. So now it's your turn. Maybe you have questions. J'ai deux ex-femmes, mais euh, selon mes ex-femmes, en fait, je suis nul avec les femmes. Mais euh, euh, la vérité, comme j'ai dit, en fait, on, on va parler en français maintenant, enfin. Euh, la vérité, en, euh, comme j'ai dit, en fait, je n'ai jamais pensé comme une femme. Je, euh, je pense seulement comme, en fait, euh, ma narratrice. Mais aussi, en, euh, ce n'est pas comme je pense. Et qu'est-ce qu'est la réaction d'une femme dans cette situation Ça, c'est stupide, ça, c'est nul. Euh, mais la vérité, euh, j'ai grandi au milieu d'un mariage en fait pas terrible. Mes parents se sont disputés tout le temps. Euh, on a commencé dans un appart de 65 mètres carrés. Et on était trois, mes parents et moi, je suis l'aîné, et puis un autre deux frères, et puis on a déménagé. Euh, mais ce n'est pas une, une famille avec beaucoup d'argent et il y a beaucoup, beaucoup, beaucoup de tensions. Je pense que j'ai commencé d'observer ça. Et c'était aussi, en fait, les, euh, les années 60, quand j'avais en fait, 10 ans hein, à peu près. C'était aussi la génération où ma mère, elle a eu une petite euh, boulot dans la télé, en fait, à la fin des années... Uh, 50, en fait, juste au, au milieu des années 50, uh, je suis né en 55, 1er janvier, uh, mon anniversaire. Et uh, après ça, elle est devenue femme, femme au foyer. Je connais beaucoup, beaucoup de mes camarades de classe de l'université, en fait, hyper éduqués, qui ont suivi, en fait, uh, le même chemin. Uh, et aussi des autres... Uh, des femmes euh, professionnelles, certaines qui ont mélangé les deux. Et euh, franchement, le dilemme de ça. Euh, je suis très féministe, peut-être parce que euh, à cause ou grâce à ma mère aussi, qui était, euh, euh, qui était une femme euh, impossible en même temps et, et, et euh, toujours anxieuse. Euh, le truc... Quelque chose de très important pour un écrivain, c'est l'empathie. L'empathie, c'est essentiel dans la vie. Mais l'empathie aussi, c'est hyper important parce que tout le monde lutte. Tout le monde. Je lutte, vous luttez. Tout le monde lutte avec quelque chose. Tout le monde est d'une certaine manière déçu. 
aussi. La, la vérité, en fait, on a des rêves et puis il y a la vie. <rire> et, et il y a un grand gouffre entre les deux. Uh, et aussi, on, on fait des choix. Qu'est-ce que c'est euh, le destin? Est-ce qu'il y a le destin ou pas? Ça, c'est une grande question existentielle. Pour moi, en fait, le destin, des choses arrivent tout le temps. Et après ça, en fait, euh, il y a des choix. Par exemple, le 2 novembre, en fait, euh, 21, euh, j'ai un appart à Berlin aussi. Ich spreche Deutsch, oh, das ist meine dritte Sprache, aber, aber nicht heute. Um, et euh, j'ai juste terminé, en fait, mon écriture de la journée. J'ai euh, décidé, ok, je vais aller au club du sport. J'ai une vélo à, à Berlin en, et puis en fait je vais doucher là-bas, hein, quelque chose à manger et je suis un grand amateur de la musique classique et du jazz et, et un club du jazz, il y a un groupe intéressant. Ok, je vais faire ça, ça euh, avec mon ordinateur portable. À la dernière minute en fait, jusqu'à j'ai commencé à quitter en fait la maison, en fait le, le téléphone a sonné, c'était une copine au milieu d'un divorce. Et euh, assez hystérique. OK, on a parlé une demi-heure. OK, du calme, du calme, du calme. J'ai quitté, en fait, euh, la maison. J'ai traversé la rue et où il y avait un tram, un tram à bord. J'ai décidé de, en fait, euh, franchement, euh, traverser la rue avant le tram. J'ai fait ça et puis je suis dans le chemin. 30 secondes après, bang, un autre vélo m'a renversé, en fait. Et soudainement jeté en plein air, comme ça. Heureusement, en fait, j'ai porté un casque. Euh, J'étais hospitalisé, euh, mes lèvres étaient ouvertes, j'ai perdu deux dents. Euh, ils ont pensé que j'ai cassé, en fait, euh, le visage et un de mes genoux. En fait, rien n'est arrivé, sauf le fait que pour quatre semaines, Uh, j'ai le visage de quelqu'un qui est dans une dispute, dans une barre, et qui a, qui a perdu le dispute. Uh, mon point, si le téléphone n'a pas sonné, si j'ai décidé de rester, oui, de l'autre côté, juste avant le, tra le tram est passé, peut-être le résultat aurait été complètement différent. Complètement différent. Ça, c'est la vie aussi. Uh, ça c'est la vie aussi quand on rencontre quelqu'un qui va changer le trajet d'une vie en fait uh, ça c'est typiquement du hasard du hasard en fait je ne suis pas quelqu'un très uh, pas, pas religieux pas de tout mais la foi m'intéresse parce que c'est toujours une hypothèse c'est toujours une hypothèse en fait uh, j'ai une camarade de classe de l'université qui était hyper marxiste à l'époque, c'était les années 70. Et après euh, l'université, c'est très américain, il est devenu le directeur de marketing pour un régime. Euh, et aussi, il a rencontré une femme, que je déteste, qui était hyper chrétienne. Et maintenant, euh, il est très évangéliste. Euh, je reçois des, euh, en fait, des cartes de, de Noël avec une citation de la Bible, oui, en fait. Euh, et on va, en fait, pour son 60e anniversaire, ses filles ont, ont écrit quelque chose pour, en fait, quel, quel père. Et aussi, euh, grâce à, à papa, on est proche de Jésus. Euh, le truc, en fait... Euh, on a, on a dîné une fois, en fait, récemment. Et je lui ai dit, honnêtement, en fait, il y a, euh, en fait pour moi, c'est un conte de fait. C'est simplement un conte de fait. Et il n'a pas de preuve. Ce n'est pas empirique. Euh, la foi, c'est exactement comme ça. Et OK, je suis cool avec euh, l'idée de la foi. Si vous, vous pensez qu'après ça, en fait, il y a le paradis. Pour moi, l'idée du paradis, c'est ennuyeux. Euh, qui, qui arrive au paradis Rien. On est là-bas. Et il n'y a rien, en fait. Pas de dispute, pas de sexe, pas, pas d'une barre, en fait, pas de jazz. En fait. Qui est arrivé au, au paradis et, et pourquoi on, on attend ça 
quand on a la vie maintenant, euh, dans tous les, les... Mais, mais une autre chose derrière de ça, c'est l'idée que on peut, oui, au paradis, on peut perfectionner la condition humaine, pas neutraliser la condition humaine. Euh, honnêtement, en fait, euh, je pense que quand je regarde quelqu'un, je, euh, je pense tout le temps, OK, il ou elle lutte avec quoi Une autre question, monsieur uh, My question is in English. I, I didn't need that. I do, I do anything. Um, it was about your writing techniques. Uh, you said writing 500 words a day. And I was questioning myself, would you, aren't you afraid to leave gaps in your own narrative? Are you organizing your 500 words around a description or around um, an action or a character? Or just things that come Oh, no, 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 no. 500 words. I'm moving the story forward. Okay. Always. That's the view. I'm, I'm writing a novel. That's and it. Aren't you afraid to leave gaps in your um, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I have to sleep. And <laughs> but it's interesting, though. I mean, it's a good point. There are writers, and I'll do this in English now, but I can do it in French, but I'll do it in English. There are writers, for example, who do a big plan beforehand. I have a friend, Jean-Christophe Ruffin, um, and I mean, he's like an architect. He sits there, and for months, he plans everything out in advance. I write very structured books. I have never made a plan in my life, ever once. I make it up as I go along. And what's interesting is characters come into the narration that I had no idea of. I believe very much in how the subconscious works. Having said that, um, what's interesting to me is, for example, the next time you're reading a, a a book. All right, I'll, I'll just talk about this one, about Afraid of the Light. And it's, this is something very important. It's very technical in, in writing fiction, and it's called exposition, l'exposition. Exposition, basically, put it this way, unless you're writing David Copperfield by Dickens, which begins at a birth and continues on, you're basically coming to a novel, you're starting it at a certain moment in time, okay? So in Afraid of the Light, the first line is, where are we going? Um, which also is a larger question for America, but it's actually the voice of a character, a rather unpleasant man, who's sitting in the back of my narrator's Uber car. And they're stuck in traffic, and the guy is berating him. And in seven or eight pages, what you find out is that my narrator basically has ended up here for a variety of reasons. And he did the job that this nasty man in uh, the back seat is doing for another company. And then in the next chapter, there's another two clients in Uber. And I also start to bring in more about his ba about Brendan's, my narrator's background. You start to learn about his marriage and how unhappy it is, his choices that he made. This is exposition. The thing is, you see, a novel starts here and moves forward, but you also have to understand what happened in the past. You know, it's a bit like, you know, going out on a date with somebody. Um, and you go out and you start to tell each other things about each other. But people usually don't come out and say, you know, um, I'm taking five Ambien a day, you know. Uh <laughs> I have an Oxycontin habit, you know. Um, I had a fetish with rabbits for a while or something like that. You know, I mean, you know, you know, people don't, that might come out later, you know, but it will not come out in the first date. Um, everyone's on their best behavior, as I was saying. Um, it's the same with writing fiction, really. And so I think the next time you're looking at a novel, I'll talk about uh, Madame Bovary, okay, which is a very interesting piece of construction, which I've analyzed. The first 40 pages of Madame Bovary, who is the central character? Charles, le médecin, uh, and you discover, and it's, it's, and also what's interesting about Madame Bovary is it's a novel written 80 years before Freud. Freud changed literature. Freud changed everything. So what you discover, and it's uh, is basically Charles Bovary is this small town doctor, and he's a mama's boy. He was always under the skirts of maman, 
And then he married this older woman who was another version of mummy, you know. Um, and then she died. And essentially, he's looking for a young wife. And there's this very pretty local girl, uh, not educated, actually kind of stupid, Emma. And she comes in, but it's only after 40 pages. What you realize at this point, and this is the sort of structural uh, integrity of, of, of Flaubert's novel, what you realize immediately is you're seeing what she's walking into. She's dealing with a man who actually has very little experience of the world outside Mammon and his elderly first wife, who's died, uh, who has very little confidence in himself, and is very small town uh, in his viewpoint. Uh, she has no experience of anything, frankly. Her idea of romance is Romain Degas, uh, à l'eau de rose. Uh, and so you can see this catastrophe about to create. That's also exposition. It's the hardest thing in writing fiction. It's why a lot of people give up. And it's something I have to do several times over to get right. Do I, what's interesting is I've rarely gone back and rewritten a book while writing it. One case, five days, I was about 180 pages in, and I kept thinking, this doesn't work, this doesn't work, this doesn't work, something's wrong here. And I was in a, I, I love to cross country ski off ski fall, and I was in northern Canada at a hotel, and every day I would come back, and I just one day just said to hell with this, and I started rewriting the whole thing uh, off, my, off the manuscript I had and cut 80 pages, and I, 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 I finally got it, and it worked. That's another thing as well, and I said this before. Don't be afraid to write too much. Don't be afraid that it might not be perfect. All writing is about rewriting. It's always about rewriting. As I said, you know, um, every novelist, I write five to six drafts of every book. Um, and, you know, my daughter, who's just finished her first novel, she called me up about a year and a half ago. I'm someone who doesn't go to bed early. I go to bed about three in the morning. Not here, because I have to be up today, but uh, about three in the morning. And basically, she called me one night in Paris from New York at three in the morning, and she said, you know, I'm this novel I'm writing, it's crap. It's awful. You know, said, I'm out. Uh, I'm going to stop. And I, and I said, well, that's your decision. And I said, let me tell you something very brutal, um, as much as I love you. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to talk to you writer to writer, not father to daughter. If you don't finish the book, you'll be sad, I'll be sad, and the rest of the world will not care a damn. <laughs> and that's the truth. Writing is something, it's a confidence trick you play on yourself every day, and it's something you have to do for yourself, and to want to try to get out there and get readers. And, I mean, I knew success when I was 41. And I had two children. I, I was r I'd been writing at that point professionally for 13 years, you know. And I had books published, and I was, you know, a, 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 a known journalist and writer around town in London at that point. But success, no, you know. Um, I was scrambling all the time. And even after I had the success, um, there were periods when I lost my American publisher for about seven years. Um, where things that, a novel that you think is going to be huge turned out to be okay. Um, that's the other thing about a long creative career. I'm, you know, 26 books. I actually have the 27th in my bag. I immediately started something else. Um, you're going to have ups and downs. The thing is just to keep going. That's the hardest part of, of writing is just to keep going. And I do know people who've just given up too at a certain point, and they just said enough. Um, I'm compulsive. It's interesting, you can't control life, but I can control what I'm writing. You know, I don't want to control other people. I have no interest in that whatsoever. I'm a very independent man. Uh, but I can control the destiny of what I'm working on on the page. Um, and Cecile can say this, on, on the way out here from Bordeaux today, I just said, je vais écrire, and I opened my laptop, and I worked for 20 minutes.
and I wrote 150 words before coming to speak to you. That's writing. Anyone else? Madame? Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, I have a simple question about uh, language. Mm -hmm. uh, your French is beautiful, and you speak German. Have you ever considered writing in another language? Absolutely not. And, do you, <laughs> and do you, the second part was, uh, do you collaborate with your translators at all? Or is this a collaborator with French? Um, two things. I mean, you know, I, I live half my life in French. I'm fluent. Um, with my little accent, but I'm fluent and I make little mistakes because I always will. Um, but writing outside of English for me just seems, I write emails and I write texts in French all the time, but in terms of actually writing fiction, no. You know, um, I was talking to a friend who uh, is trying to write a film at the moment and he said, I'm going to shoot it in English and I, he's French, and I said, uh, who's going to, he said, I'm, I'm writing the dialogue in English. I said, don't do that. And he went, what? I said, don't do that. It's going to be terrible. Uh, in the same way, if I tried to write spoken French, it would be awful. Um, also, I have two very good translators with whom I work, uh, one for my books, one for my nonfiction, et cetera. C Chloe Royer, I had a translator for 20 years, Bernard Cohen, but he turned into this kind of crazed drunk. And uh, and he was just messing up on translations, and my editor and I got together uh, in 2017, just as I delivered La Saint Petit du Hasard, and I just said, you know, he's impossible. And she said, thank you. Uh, and so we fired him. And basically, there was a young woman doing a stage at uh, Les Editions Belfond, Claude Royer, and the head of translation gave her basically the first two chapters of. Uh, La Symphonie du Hasard, du premier tome. And um, they came back to me about three weeks later, and no one said anything, and I read them, and I just called them. Uh, my then editor, Francois Truffaut, uh, c'est génial, mon dieu, en fait. The thing is, clearly, French and English are two very separate universes. The way I phrase things, the way I think, is different in English than it is in French, as you do as well. And I think this is where a translator is crucial, because to use a German word, they become your doppelganger, uh, son ombre, and they have to reinvent you in the language completely. Uh, and that's very, very important. Um, and Chloe now is almost 30. You know, uh, still a kid, really. Uh, and you know, and we were. I just did a, a, a theater play, and she's just done the translation on that, and she's absolutely first rate. But I stay out of it, really. <coughs> I, uh, you know, I, I might make an occasional comment on things, and we we will talk about things in advance. But I largely stay out of it. I, I, I have confidence with her. You know, I'm not a micromanager. I don't like that very much. Anyone else? I have to admit, I had never heard about a doula. It's very interesting. There are uh, very few of these women in France. No, they, they don't exist. Yeah. And how you in the novel, uh, my Uber driver, a client comes into his life just randomly, you know, it's the next pair. And she's a woman, she's 70, très universitaire, en fait, clearly someone who qui a fait la retraite near UCLA, not bling bling, very East Coast wasp, if you know that expression, you know, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, polite, she has two newspapers, she asks to listen to the public radio, clearly very, very educated. And there's an address 15 kilometers away, and it's an abortion clinic, and something happens there, bad. And, he, and basically, Brendan becomes her driver, and Elise has retired, but she is working as a doula. How I found out about this was my daughter Amelia again. Uh, when she was in the acting program at CalArts, she, one of her teachers, who was African American, one of her professors, talked with her one day about just, she said, I have this voluntary work I do on the weekends. I'm a doula. And I said, what's a doula? Uh, and she explained that 
it's there for women who are pregnant and also for women who are about to have an abortion and they don't have anyone with them. Frequently, women who are having abortions, either they've been abandoned or f sometimes they've been raped uh, or they're, they are young, you know, they're, and basically they can't tell their parents or they're doing this without the knowledge of a partner or they don't have a partner and they're on their own. And this woman essentially is with them before, during, and after. Um, and she's there basically to provide support and friendship. And I thought immediately, that's very interesting. Uh, what an interesting thing to do. And I interviewed a doula, and, you know, and I asked her, how do you approach it? We talked for about two hours. This is the interesting thing about writing as well. There is you know, also another side of this book, which is you know, a woman who's a, a Catholic fanatic and anti-abortion and a former girlfriend. I knew she had an aunt who was you know, crazy Catholic and very much in the anti-abortion movement. And I said, would you give me her number? And she talked for three hours. Blah, 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 blah. Like I was just, you know, it was nonstop. And my, I had my, one of my yellow eagle pads and my pen was just flying across the page. Um, but you know, a doula, it's, it, it's, it's very important work. And also what you're dealing with every time is someone who's in a very vulnerable place. This is where I, I think, you know, I am so, so in favor of legal abortion completely. And I think the people who are against it, they're misogynistic. They're trying to control women's bodies and it's none of their damn business. And they're also, they're frightened of sex. Those three things are going on and they feel that people should be punished for actually, you know, having conceived a baby, you know, which they don't want or decide they don't want. It's very, very 18th and 19th century. And the doula is there largely to be with the person and there's two things in the book which were, um, I invent, oh, uh, and it's not all always just women from bad economic backgrounds. You know, in the novel there's a, a Hollywood producer and who's gotten pregnant by her lover and her husband is, you know, going to kill her if she finds out, so to speak, metaphorically. Um, and she's a very angry person. Um, I'm interested in that as well, as just people in very difficult places and how they react to the heat. But yes, it's it's something that doesn't exist in France. But it's very good. It's very good. And it's also there for women who are pregnant and have no one, and but have decided to go through with the birth, but have no one to be with. So yeah, I, I, think, it's, I think it's very humane and admirable. I really do. Anyone else? Oh, sorry. Okay. You first. Oh, okay. Um, it struck me that um, all the writers that I've uh, listened to uh, interviews, that, that of whom I've listened to interviews, what I'm doing with my sorry. Um, uh, no, I, I'm actually more of an easy English. Um, I just have trouble okay. saying sometimes. Um, uh, it struck me that your general feelings towards writing and the way that you approach stories um, is actually a lot closer to my own, the, the, the way I uh, write. Um, so I found that really interesting. The main difference being that I am very much an architect and I'm not realizing that it got me stuck for a long while. Um, but uh, so I was wondering, uh, when you are like rewriting a book, what are the main things that change uh, from one draft to another? I mean, it's, it really is very specific to each book. Each book for me is, has its own set of problems. And, and the other thing is I've never written the same book. I have themes that are constant, but I've, I always change. I mean, before Afraid of the Light, I wrote Isabelle L'Après-Midi, which is a history of a, a cinq à sept qui dure vingt, uh, 35 ans entre an American and Francaise. So uh, very different. It's a book about uh, being in a couple and not being in a couple. It's about intimacy. Uh, it's about good sex. It's also about, um, frankly, is it true that maybe passion continues if you're not seeing someone day in, day out? Is it stronger that way? 
Um, that went through a, a wild variety of changes. I think the important thing, again, you can be an architect. You can plot it all out. There's nothing wrong with that. Remember my first comment, there are three rules for writing a novel. Nobody knows what they are. So you, you make up your rules as you go along. You can find out. And, you know, it, you know, I remember starting, and it took me a long time to build up to writing a novel. I was 30, good Lord, I was 39 when my first novel came out, Kudzak, which is now Pierre Schrup Seattle in the new version. Um, and I'd written written three Récits de Voyage before that to find my way as a writer of books. Um, and before that, I wrote plays. Not very good plays, but I wrote plays. Um, you can be an architect and have everything there. And then you get it on the page. And then you, uh, the important thing is you have to look at it critically or maybe also g give it to somebody who you trust and just see what they think. I have always two readers who are not in the business reading when I'm writing because I like having the feedback. And my only question to them, it's usually women, my only question to women friends or a girlfriend and uh, uh, a woman friend who basically is, does it work? Are you turning the page? The rest I can figure out later on. I mean, here, you know, I think... Uh, I rewrote the opening four or five times before I got it right. Uh, I ch uh, Brendan, in an earlier draft, was Mexican-American. I thought that's not going to work. I turned him into Irish Catholic. Um, I changed a tremendous amount of stuff as I went along. The important thing is the first draft, you get it out there. You have something to work with. And that's very crucial. And my feeling is keep going keep going, don't stop. You know, you can rewrite it, and at least you can say, I've written the first draft of a novel. That's a big deal. Very few people do what I do, uh, because it's not easy. The other thing I, would a I think you should ask yourselves is, how much do you like being by yourself? It's a big question. Um, I have, I'm very easy and open. There's a part of me that's also a loner. You know, uh, I'm, you know, I've been told this by certain women. Um, you know, I'm, I'm slightly closed off. And that's part of, you know, being a novelist. I spend a lot of time alone. Um, and I'm, I'm perfectly happy with that. That's not for everyone as well. How, mu how well do you deal with self-doubt? And everyone has self-doubt. That's also part of, of, of the game as well. And how well... Are you adapting to the idea of having to do the discipline of working every day? That is crucial. Write every day. Because it's the one way you learn how to write, and also it develops a rhythm. It just becomes part of your life. You know, I have a little computer in this bag. I call it my cafe computer, uh, a little Microsoft Surface. Um, and, you know, it, it, I write everywhere. I wrote in the car today. I wrote yesterday on the tram going out to an event. Um, I'll go back to the hotel, and, and I'm trying to write a 1,000 words of this new book every day. Uh, I'm trying to get it done quickly. It's also an essay. It's very different. Um, but that is crucial. And in the end, no one cares if you do this or not. No one. You know, the world is full of people who say, oh, I want to write a book. We'll never get around to it. You have to very much want to do it. And I think one of the hardest things, I, I gave a, a talk at uh, Paris 4 a couple of years ago, the Sorbonne, and someone said, how can I be you? And I just said, do you like being by yourself? How well do you deal with disappointment and setbacks? And do you have 20 years? Because it, it can take time to actually, and you know, and success is a very fragile veneer. You know, sometimes the worst thing that can happen to a, a young writer is success early on. Uh, Francois Sagan, great example, great writer, but in the af after uh, Bonjour Tristesse, Aimez-vous Brahms, after that, there wasn't a lot, you know, and she struggled. Um, and then there are writers who are in their 40s and, you know, it, it comes right. Um, there's no right or wrong about this, but, um, 
you know, Annie Arnaud, who just won the Nobel Prize. I mean, she was only really beginning to get recognized in her 40s, you know, and on, on a world stage even the last 20 years. The thing is for me, it's, I was very surprised when Lumki Vulevi Vasavi uh, became a worldwide success. And it changed certain things. I could buy a house. I could, you know, do certain things that I wasn't able to do in the past. But there was still the next book to write, and the one after that, and the one after that, and the one after that, and some of them have. And I also decided not to try to write the same thing, which annoyed my American editor a lot. Uh, he wasn't pleased. He said, "I want you to do the same thing every year." And I said, no, I'm not like that. And so I wrote La Passuite de Bonneau, which he rejected, but eventually got published in the States. Um, the thing is, you know, it's just about the work. It really is, uh, first and foremost. Um, and as hard as it is, I actually love what I do. And if you can say that at a certain point in your life, you're lucky. Because I know a lot of people who don't like what they do. They're good at it, but they don't like it, especially lawyers. And <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Um, I have a, a number of questions, including one about your plumber, but I'll leave that. <laughs> um, uh, but, but I would like to know, maybe for our students, um, who are the American writers that you admire? In the past or the present, also not necessarily. Um, variety of writers. I mean, the great, crazy, vast American novel is Moby Dick by Melville, which I was at a very good lycée in New York, uh, and we actually spent a year, when I was 16 years old, analyzing Moby Dick. How about that? Uh, it's not an easy book whatsoever. It's a huge novel. I don't know if it influenced me, but I admire it as much as one admires Joyce's Ulysses. Um, the, the, the writers who've had a play in my head, clearly Hemingway, Fitzgerald, Gatsby Le Magnifique, which I think is probably the most perfect American writer, writer novel ever written, and just with 60,000 words. Uh, yeah. Can you explain why The Great Gatsby? Because I know you... Oh yeah, I, I was... I was, I was uh, yeah, I know. Yeah. Why Gatsby Le Magnifique? Um, it's very much, there are two things about it. It's about money more than anything else and what money means in American life and how money is our civil religion and how money is the way we keep score and also how money is the way, in a way, we, 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 we make terrible mistakes. Um, it's also, for me, um, a novel about the fact that in America everyone reinvents themselves in a certain way. Uh, you don't really know who somebody is. Everyone is lying to a certain deg degree. Um, also, the narrator Nick Carraway, um, I've always identified with Nick Carraway because he's somebody in the middle of things, but he's also standing back and taking notes. That's me completely. I've always seen myself in that way. The other thing is, word for word, line by line, it's absolutely perfect. He was an astonishingly good writer. Um, it's of his novels, it's the one I've always responded to, and I think it's, it's absolutely perfect. And it was a disaster when it was published. He, this is interesting, Fitzgerald, when he was 22, 23 years old, wrote a novel called This Side of Paradise. It was the early 1920s, and he was celebrated as the great young American writer. And he moved to Paris with his wife. He was writing a weekly short story for the Saturday Evening Post, for which he was being paid in today's money the equivalent of 20,000 euros a week. And... Um, he was a spendthrift, he became an alcoholic, uh, and by the time he wrote Gatsby, money was, all the money was gone. His wife was institutionalized in an asylum. She was crazy, Zelda. Uh, and this novel, which he knew he had done something extraordinary with, sold 3,000 copies. Uh, and he died 10 years later of a heart attack. So uh, Gatsby is very important for me. Um, 
I'd recommend, frankly, you read an American writer called Richard Yates, Y A T E U S. Surtout, en fait, La Fenêtre Panoramique, which was filmed as Revolutionary Road a couple of years ago with Kate Winslet and Leonardo DiCaprio. That novel really influenced me because it's about a couple who meet after the war and move to the suburbs of Connecticut and then tear each other apart. It's one of the darkest books I've ever read about marriage. And I read it and I just thought, these are my parents. <laughs> they, I, I, this was, we didn't move to the burbs, but we spent every summer in the, in the burbs in Connecticut. And just, these are my parents. And also it's very much about two people who have trapped themselves in something and can't get out. It's that very interesting thing about life, you know, and I hear that. I think sometimes I was thinking about this when my father died as well, and he could never leave my mother, and it was a, it was a terrible marriage. And when I once said to him, the door is there, you know, uh, from here to that door is what? Three meters? A lot of people can't walk through the door. You know, a lot of people can't. Why? That novel is, is quite extraordinary. I would also recommend reading anything by Raymond Chandler, uh, who basically was an Englishman who came to America and who reinvented uh, the American detective novel, but was also a great writer about Los Angeles. And Chandler also reinvented American prose the way Hemingway did as well. Uh, and he also saw that America was this capitalistic circus, uh, and again, where money counts for everything. Um, he's very funny, very dry, um, very punchy. Um, and the thing is, I still read two or three books a week, you know? Uh, I don't watch a lot of television. I go to the movies a lot. I go to classical concerts and jazz all the time. But, you know, reading is still part of my life. Um, I can't leave the house without a book in my bag and a review literaire. Um, read as much as you can. You know, it's, 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 it's how you learn how to write as well. Anyone else? Sure. That's a good question. I mean, I, I think I, 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 I jokingly said once in an interview on the BBC, I decided to become a writer because I could go to movies in the afternoon. Uh, I didn't want to be in an office. Um, but actually, when I was eight years old, I wrote a short story for my teacher in school in New York. And it's about an eight-year-old boy with a difficult mother. And he loses the mother in, in a supermarket, and he's very happy. He's on his own. He's wandering by himself. It was very Freudian. And she said, this is very good. You should keep doing this. When I was at university, I could not get a single story published in the University Literary Review. I couldn't. Um, the man who edited it became a very successful agent de mobilier. Uh, there, <laughs> there is a god. Um, <laughs> And uh, I'm very successful at Agent Immobilier, but he, you know, he, uh, he never published anything of mine. And it, it took a long time for me to get going. Um, I, w I was having plays done on the BBC when I was 25, 26, but properly establishing myself, you know, that took a long time. Um, writing is a compulsion. It's just something I have lived by my pen. I have no family money. I have lived by this since 1983, so it's almost 40 years. Um, and I've made my way just that way. I did journalism, you know, I've never taught. I mean, I've taught occasionally, and I like doing events like this. Um, but it's always been writing, you know, and I figured out ways of doing it. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm, I'm happy writing, that's uh, the funny thing. I mean, it's not a happy experience often. Uh, but also, uh, why do I write? Um, never under underestimate guilt is a very important thing as well. If I haven't written, I feel guilty. You know, if I haven't met the quota of words every day, I feel bad about that. Um, 
also, you know, I, I guess what's interesting is every novel is a new adventure. Um, and every time I've written a novel, in the middle of every book I've ever written, I've always thought, this is terrible. You know, uh, this is absolutely terrible. It doesn't work. Um, I had an interesting experience recently. My agent in London read the, the second draft of the new novel, and he said, I don't like this whatsoever, and I don't think I can represent it. And we'd been having problems, and I went off, and I actually wrote a play in the meantime. And then in August, I came back to it and rewrote it the way I felt it should be rewritten. And my French editor said, it's brilliant. Uh, had I listened to him, I would have stopped. Uh, but I wasn't going to listen to him completely. That's another thing as well. Everyone will tell you, don't do this, don't do that. You can't make it. You know, that's, uh, you know, do something sh sure where you can make money, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you can figure it out. You can do this if you want to, you know, but you have to figure out ways of doing it. The difference now is it's a different world. I'll show you the most dangerous thing that is menacing literature. It's very simple. That. We all have one of these, don't we? Yeah. Everyone does. I mean, I now see, mm, I was in... Uh, uh, Monoprix in, in Paris the other day, in, uh, près de chez moi dans le dixième, and I saw this four-year-old kid, you know, with an iPhone, you know, his own iPhone. And I was going, that's not right. Uh, my children are 30 and 26, and they're sort of, they, they talk about the fact that, you know, they both got phones when they were 15. And they were flip phones. That's how old they are. Uh, they were a different world. I mean, now we're so connected and we're so disconnected at the same time, which is very true. And it, it's changed everything. It's changed absolutely everything. The way we see the world, the way we get news, the fact that actually, is there anything called privacy anymore? You know, if you have one of these, you know, if, if, uh, if the Sûreté or the CIA or whatever wanted to find out about you, I'm not a, a paranoid, but it's all there, you know. If you're arrested by the police, the first thing they do now is look at your phone, you know, and they find out what have you been looking at, who have you been in touch with, what have you been writing in texts. Uh, it's a very, we're, we're in, and, and this has also changed our rapport with the, the written word. Newspapers are not the same as they were when I started my career. 40 years ago. It's a very different world and they're endangered. Having said that, there's always a need for stories and people want stories. And so go out and write stories. Thank you. Anyone else? Hi. Uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, when you wrote books, uh, did you have to uh, deal with uh, 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 the crisis? Um, as I think you'll find out as life goes on, life is an ongoing existential crisis. <laughs> <laughs> Madame est d'accord. Yeah, I mean, it's an, it's an ongoing existential crisis. In fact, yes. Uh, especially if you get into a couple, especially if you have children. It's, yes, it's um, how you balance work, career, this, that, and the other. I mean, what I write about, all novels in one way or another are about an existential crisis. Show me a story where there isn't a problem. When my daughter was three years old, she sort of finds this story funny now. She turned to me one evening. Uh, I was putting her to bed, and she said, you know, Papa, tell me the story of the three little pigs, le trois petits cochons et le grand méchant loup, mais sans le grand méchant loup. And <laughs> I, she said, j'ai peur de grand méchant loup. And I thought about it, and I said, okay, w they have a house of sticks, a house of bricks, a house of, yes, a uh, house of straw, now what? They, they, f they form a residence association, I mean, and you know, and I said, I can't do it. And she said, why? I said, where's the problem? Where is the problem, you know? Hamlet, uh, you know, hated his father and thinks that his new stepfather is a good guy. There's no story, immediately, you know? Um, every story is based on an existential crisis. 
um, and of some form or another, every story has a problem at the center to it. And so, I mean, and in terms of writing, I mean, every day is a sort of existential crisis because you've got to kind of keep, I, I woke up at four this morning uh, in my hotel room in, in Bordeaux um, and crept over to the, the desk because the girlfriend was asleep and I opened up my laptop and I basically worked for 90 minutes and I went through what I wrote yesterday in this new book and try to kind of, and I, I realized I wasn't happy with it, and it's probably one of the reasons I was awake. So I was having an existential crisis at four in the morning and kind of got it right and continued on. That's, you know, uh, frankly, I, I think, as you will discover, life is about problems. And you will have a lot of them. You probably do already. Uh, but you'll have a lot of them, you know. Um, I mean, I'm sure, you know, Half of you here are from families where there's divorce, yes? You know, um, my kids have been through that. Um, I went through a, a difficult family. How you actually deal with problems in your life uh, is also kind of a part of how your life will turn out. Um, you know, what you want. I think the hardest question in the world is, qu'est-ce qu'on veut? What do you want? And I said this to my daughter recently, especially about a guy she was seeing, um, and I stay out of it, but you know, if she, when I let her tell me, I never ask, um, because I'm smart. And, but I said to her, what's important is not knowing what you want, because that will change. What's important, and I'll say this to all of you, is knowing what you don't want. That's really crucial. Figuring out what you don't want. No, I don't want to end up like that. I don't want to be in the verbs with two kids and da, da, da. If you want that, fine. Some people do, other people don't. Knowing what you don't want is very, very important. And just realizing that it's life is just one problem after another, but that's kind of interesting as well. Uh, you can't have a perfect life and happiness is here and there, but if you can have an interesting life, that's wonderful. And also the other fact of the matter is, and this is also all in my, my books and just in my own life, nobody avoids tragedy. Nobody. It will come for you at some point or another. Um, that is just also the price we pay for being here. Um, but again, there's a great line of a German poet of the 19th century named Novalis, same uh, epoch as Goethe, not as well known. And he said something which I think is crucial to when I think about character. And he said, character is destiny. Le character est le destin. <laughs> and I think that's very true. Um, I know people who have been through terrible things. They've lost children, for example. I have two friends who've lost children of my generation. There's nothing worse, nothing worse as a parent. It's the great nightmare. Um, and they have survived in, in certain ways and gotten on with their lives. I've known people who've actually had something small happen to them and they've gone off the deep end. Uh, I had a, a friend's mother who was, she had a job and she was selling advertisements on a radio station and she had four bad months and she was told she was being let go, she was just divorced and she jumped out a window and didn't survive. It was the 12th floor in Manhattan. Uh, that was shocking. Um, but why does one person survive something terrible and another person goes over the deep end? That's the mystery. That's the mystery. You can come out of a terrible family and actually have an interesting life and, a, you know, and, and possibly become a good parent and develop a stable relationship or whatever. You can come out of a family with everything and it can go wrong. You know, why? That's also the mystery. Should we have one last question? Hmm. Okay, we'll do two. Okay. Monsieur. I have one very practical question. Oh, sorry. Um, I have one very practical question, I think, is as a writer, especially when you begin, how do you not get ripped off by your editor? Who do I what? How, how do you avoid getting ripped off by your editor? Oh, um, 
I mean, it's, it's an interesting point. There used to, when I was starting to write in 1988, when I published my first book, um, publishing was a very different world in all countries. Uh, I was being published first in London, and it was a very famous uh, small editor called George Allen and Unwin. The family fortune was J.R.R. Tolkien. You know who he is, you know. Le Seigneur des Agneaux. And they'd made a lot of money. They had a house on Museum Street opposite the British Museum. It was very gentlemanly. You know, everyone was sort of very, hello, Douglas, nice to meet you. You know, it was very, very English. You weren't paid a lot of money. You didn't need a lot of money to live in, uh, in London in those days. And there was a sense of, you know, welcome to the family. You know, you're part of us now. And then, basically, in the early 90s, publishing began to get corporatized. Rupert Murdoch, you know of that bastard, yes. I mean, he, he, was, he bought George Allen and then when they became part of HarperCollins, which is a huge multinational uh, English language uh, publisher in America, in the UK, in Australia, in Canada, all the, Eng the, the big English-speaking places. And so that has disappeared. Now, I mean, the fact is, it used to be you would join, you would be taken on by an editor, and you would s spend the rest of your life there, you know, your writing life, hopefully. That doesn't work that way anymore. Uh, it's a much tougher game. And, you know, now I have friends who can't get published anymore. And these are people who were successful writers as well. It's a little easier in France than it is in the English-speaking world. I've been dropped by com uh, countries. I haven't been published in Germany in 10 years. That will happen again. I have to be patient. And the thing is, you know, as long as you're getting published somewhere, that's good. You know, you are getting out there in print. Um, the thing is, as well, I have never, ever, ever tried to think about what the marketplace wants. You know, oh, I should be writing this kind of novel for now. I've never thought that. It's two years of my life, and it's basically I want to feel like I can spend two years with this idea, this project, and I feel right about it. Um, and that's it. I mean, I like the fact that, for example, you know, I have friends who are universitaires à Sciences Po ou uh, École de Mars Supérieure. They read my books, but also my concierge in Paris. I like the fact that I can play both sides of the street. Um, and, you know, uh, I have a very good editor in France, and I mean, uh, it's now 24 years together. So it's, it's a good marriage in that way. Thank you. Last one. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, all the time. Um, because I grew up with it. <laughs> I, I think that's a very interesting thing. You know, I'm, Freud said basically we repeat in adult life everything we found in childhood. And I think that's very true as well. Uh, and also, you know, your childhood in a way, whether you like it or not, defines you and what you've gone through. And so I, I grew up with two parents who were very unhappy and trapped. But what was interesting about that, though, was in a funny way, I don't think, oh, poor me. I think it made me a writer. It also made me very independent. Um, when I was 13 years old, which is 1968, that must seem like the dark ages, you know. <laughs> um, New York was dirty, dangerous, it wasn't expensive, and I started to go out on the weekends, and I would go to theaters, I would go to the Cinematheque at the Musée de l'Art Moderne. I, I, this was, I wasn't very sportive. Uh, I was very by myself a lot of the times, but I, I was beginning to love culture. And I also did it to get away from my crazy parents. And I think that also developed an independence in me, which I still have, uh, and also a, a realization I can walk out the door. I mean, I was 13. I was dependent on them. I had to come back. And I didn't, you know, I wasn't thinking about running away, but I can walk out the door. And it also opened me to other worlds as well, you know. I remember discovering La Nouvelle Vague in little uh, cinemas. I mean, going to see films by Truffaut and Godard, Rivette, uh, Romer Chavon, when I was, you know, uh, an adolescent. 
So I think, you know, everyone, the other thing about writing is use everything. Use everything that's happened to you. Uh, there's material there. I've never written a book directly, with, w with the exception of two short stories, directly about me. I've never done that. I always take a, a step away from it. But everything that's happened to me, of course I'm going to use it in a different way. That's interesting. That's the good thing about writing is everything is material. Everything's material. Shall we say that's it? Thank you very much. Thank you.